Are we ready? Ready. Born okay. ready. Uh, bo- born ready. I have the absolute pleasure to have Callum Liang with me today. Callum is joining us all the way from Singapore. Callum, hi. Thanks for joining us again. It's great to catch up again. He says again, because Callum and I knew each other back in the well, mid-90s, so back in Singapore, I think, wasn't it? When we're all yeah. running well, internet we're days. Yeah, where we were spring chickens. Yeah. Running internet businesses and uh, Callum has been an entrepreneur for many years and very successfully. And he's going to talk to us today about the group that he's built, which is Listed UK company. And he's built an amazing listed vehicle out of a number of other companies. Callum, tell us about MBH Corporation and how you've got that business noted and listed. Yeah. So very simply, MBH was a solution to a problem that I'd had as a small business owner, I think you've come across in in your realm as a small business owner, that even when you're a successful small business, you tend to face a glass ceiling. You can't, as a small business, you can't win the big contracts because you can't win the big contracts. You remain a small business. It's difficult to attract good senior staff when you're a small business. You don't have the resources of a big company. And then what tends to happen, successful small businesses get sold to bigger players in their industry. And the problem with that is that invariably you have to go along as part of that deal. So they're normally like a three-year or a five-year earnout. And the problem with us entrepreneurs is we just don't make very good employees. And so we're just not very good at being told what to do, especially when it comes to our own baby. And you've been in this industry long enough that you've seen scores, I'm sure, of entrepreneurs that have been acquired by WPP and Publicis and Omnicom and others and and have been spat out, you know, quit and discussed six months later or fired from their own company. And it just seemed like a that's not a very good solution if you've spent the last 10, 20 years of your life creating value for others. And so the idea of uh, agglomeration, uh, this particular company, MBH, is that we find good, well-run, profitable small businesses. They swap their private equity for public equity, but the founder keeps full control over their business. So it's their brand, it's their hiring and firing, it's their culture. They don't need to run anything past anyone. They just carry on running the business as they always have. Um, But they're part of this amazing collaborative of other entrepreneurs that now have a vested interest in their success and they have a vested interest in other people's success. And they've got this stock so they can go out and they can give stock incentives to staff and they can go and do their own acquisitions. Yeah, it's just a, it's a very, you know, I was saying to you earlier, I know I'm incredibly lucky. I just get to hang out with cool, successful business owners from around the world and then try and share their stories with investors. So that's a lot of fun. And you are a successful entrepreneur because in Singapore, you built a business really out of an idea. And yeah, having been uh, in those conversations with big companies and you're on a five-year earn out and more than one of my friends who sold a company didn't get the, the final year's earn out payment. So a great solution, but sort of communications perspective, Callum, you've also built a listed company uh, without all of the sort of investment bankers and, uh, and all the entourage that hang on to those vehicles. Mm. Can you just tell us that how have you been building really amongst those three audience, because you've got the potential companies to buy into, you've got your investors and you've got the ones you've bought into. Do you want us to share what have you been doing to build the brand and get noticed? Yeah. So I think, you know, some, something that, that you're delving deeply into is this idea of personal branding. And it's something that I've been working hard at. And I think I, I had that reticence that a lot of people have about not wanting to put themselves out front and all of that sort of stuff. And then I realized a number of years ago, how much time it saves you if you're well known. And I realized that if somebody, if you've written a book, for example, or even just written an article, or you've been on a podcast or somebody's read your blog post, if you have a meeting with someone and they've already heard about you and read about you, half the sales is done. They already know what you're capable of. They already know your values. And so you can get straight down to talking about logistics, which is a much more interesting conversation than when I was a younger entrepreneur, the amount of coffee meetings I used to go to and then (laughs) spend the first half hour trying to convince them that I was worthy of their time. And of course, the worst person to sell yourself is is yourself. Uh, yeah, once I embraced that idea, and, um, I did in, invest in in things like putting together a book. I put my first book out called Progressive Partnerships, 
about five, six years ago. And I've done numerous attempts. And one of the ones that, that we've been talking uh, about previously is I realized that one of the best ways to build my brand was to help other people build their brand and support other people. And, and so I put together a platform to showcase entrepreneurs that are doing cool things, but are not currently featured by the media. Because one of the other things I discovered about the media is they all say they want to break new stories and find hidden talent. But actually what they want to do is just wait till somebody else has done it and then copy what somebody else has done. What I discovered is that if I can give somebody their first published interview, put that on our platform, then very often it's much, much easier for them to then go and get other media interviews. And yeah, it just gets progressively easier. It kind of snowballs. So yeah, we've got a platform called enterprisezone.cc and we've published more than 2,000 interviews with great entrepreneurs from around the world and it's kind of built up. Yeah, that's a a really smart idea as well. And now you're telling me as well, Callum, that you've built a very nice sort of model in terms of who does the work to get noticed, recognizing that for those entrepreneurs, the value you're bringing is the platform and the distribution. So for many people, including me, I'm interviewing people and going down that, that path of content creation. You've done it a bit differently and quite smart. I think I'm going to learn some lessons from you. Just share with us your sort of workflow as well. It's mainly because I'm lazy. Smart, (laughs) just very smart. Now, I think so. so actually the the original one came about when I was, I had this idea of, I had some really cool business owners in my network that I wanted to show. And I reached out to a platform and I offered to interview these entrepreneurs for this platform. And this particular platform, their biggest challenge was they didn't have enough content. And so I had proposed to them that I would publish an interview once a month and they came back and they said, would you be open to once a week? And I jokingly said, what about once a day? And they said, yeah, that'd be great. And I went, oh, Oh. (laughs) yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah. But what I realized was that, okay, if you're going to do that, I didn't have time to do that. I was running companies and doing uh, other things. I had a day job. So if I was going to do that, I had to get smart about how I systemized it. And originally I used a lot of virtual assistants. So I would have automated email setups and virtual assistants and and people, it was the same questions and people would go into a Google doc and just fill in the answers and upload their photos and virtual assistants would do everything. So I, again, I wouldn't actually be involved until the interview was, was published and then I'd get to, to read it. And those people would also recommend other entrepreneurs that they thought deserved uh, good content. Now, actually, with the no code movement, there's a lot of great systems out there. I actually ended up getting automated an awful lot of it. So we have these interviews that get published every day. And then last summer during sort of a lockdown boredom, I launched a little mini podcast or a micro podcast. And it's just entrepreneurs answering one question. And, And the one question is, tell me about a time that you overcame a challenge in your entrepreneurial journey and what you learned from it. But again, I, I send them to a web page. They fill in their details. They upload their web and their, their photos. Uh, and then there's a button that they press and, and it's just, it records up to four minutes of their content. And as soon as yeah, they can re-record if they don't like it. And then when they hit submit, that just goes to my audio editor who tops and tails it and publishes it. And then it gets broadcast out through uh, a whole network. It, again, it, it's a very lazy man's doing it. Absolutely, Callum. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Would you care to share what's the platform uh, that enables people to just log on and then record and and share? Is that like a Loom style or? Yeah. So um, the one that I found really good that I'm using at the moment is Jotform, which is a little bit like a sort of Google form, but on steroids. It's, It's just a lot more options to it. But yeah, there's so many cool platforms now and and tool i mean that the, part of the danger is that you can get lost in the the technology and and spend days exploring it so uh, i tend to find something basic that works and then build it from there but yeah J- job form is what i'm using at the moment and it's very effective there's, there's a bunch of different options on it but i haven't explored loads but it does it also allows automated email sequences and fires off so they can recommend three other people and that fires off an email sequence and all of that good stuff which is great 
while it's working. And then a year later, something goes wrong and you have to go back into it and you can't remember what you've done or how it all ties together. <laughs> but now what we started to do is my VA records with Loom all the different processes that we've got. Because as you say, you create a process, do it once, set it, and uh, then you have to go back six months later and we can't remember you know, how we configured the auto sequencing tool. Callum, what about the investor relations? Because the sort of profiling the uh, entrepreneurs, I love that idea, brilliant. But you've got IR work to do and having uh, managed an IPO in Singapore before, it's a very different kind of business IR, isn't it? How are you managing the share price communications? Because if you've got multiple companies in the portfolio for the investors, that's a harder like, beast to understand, isn't it? It's, yes, it is. And, and I won't pretend I'm being anywhere near as effective with investors as, as I am with entrepreneurs. I, I found it's a very different mindset, very different mindset. So for example, I, I thought look, a, a really easy way to build a network of investors is just to replicate what I've done with entrepreneurs. I'll create a, a platform for investors, profiling investors. That would, that would be interesting. You ask an entrepreneur to recommend three entrepreneurs that deserve more limelight, they will give you a list 10 long. You ask an investor, to recommend someone else. And, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. It's a very different mindset. And so I think that's, I've had to change my approach a bit. But the flip of it is that one of the advantages that we've got at MBH is I don't run any of these companies. So I don't have to worry about clients and staff in the individual companies. I, I've got the time to focus on the investor relations and on the media. And so we can put together a lot of content. And, and I think that really does give us a huge advantage. I tell you, my, my heart goes out to CEOs of small companies that go public because it's really, it's a full-time job just dealing with investors. And these people already have full-time jobs. Investors and the analyst community advise the investor community. That's another yeah, uh, make or break unity. Yes, it, it is. And I think one of the other things, and we, we've been doing this now for six years. There's a lot of there's a lot of nonsense. There's an awful lot of. It's like in any industry, I guess. It's when you come into it, most people don't have any experience of the public market, so they tend to get fleeced by advisors that will tell you that you have to engage these very expensive IR people, and a lot of it's just nonsense, and they do do really poor job i give you an example we one of the I, I won't name them but they are one of the most high profile investor relation companies in the world and, and they gave us a proposal and just one part of their proposal was to build our social media and for three th this particular part of the proposal was three thousand euros a month and for three thousand euros a month they would publish three articles on linkedin for us now we had to write the articles but they would publish them on LinkedIn for us. And that was 3,000 euros a month. What's <laughs> crazy is that someone somewhere must have paid that for them to feel that's a price exactly. they can get away with. But I guess if you're a CEO and you're spending shareholder money. Yeah, and, and probably more, well, not aware of it. Yeah, you, you and I probably spend a lot of time on LinkedIn connecting with people and, and we, we know the platform and how to use it. If you've never used the platform before and, and someone tells you, oh, it's critical that you post you don't know, you don't know how to publish it and then maybe right. But it's, but yeah, the point is you can get very easily fleeced by a lot of the professionals out there. So we've had to unlearn quite a lot as well. Yeah, I can see that. With your partner companies or investee companies, Callum, what do you do uh, for them? Do they mark themselves under the umbrella brand of the group or do they really maintain their independence? Because that's a, you know, potentially interesting marketing point for those companies, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So basically we leave it up to them. Th these are not startups that we're playing with. These are the average age of the companies in the group is about 23 years. So they're well-established companies. Um, it always puzzled us that that a, a acquiring company would buy a company because it had such a great entrepreneurial spirit and, and great brand and then rebrand it and join the entrepreneurial spirit. So basically, yeah, sometimes let's say, Basically, what we say, when a company comes in, it, it is completely autonomous. It is completely independent. If they want to collaborate with other companies in the group, they're more than welcome to. 
if when they're pitching for business, they want to emphasize the part, the fact that they're part of this hundred million dollar global PLC, they're more than free to, to do that. But if they also want to play the card of, look, we're a little boutique uh, construction company that will, yeah, the founder will be here and available to talk to you. They can play that card as well. And, and it's actually, it's a really nice one because it means that at the market level, I can go out and talk to the market about, hey, we've got record profits and we're growing and it's, it's fantastic and it's a great company to invest in. If we were all the same brand, that makes it very difficult when they're out pitching to to clients trying to or trying to squeeze suppliers for the best price. Whereas now, because it's completely independent, yeah, that they've got that, and they're also kind of protected. If another company in the group has a problem, yeah, it's a PR scandal or collapses, they're not going to be tarnished by that because there's you've got that difference. Yeah, so that's uh, really nice. Gives them a lot of flexibility, doesn't it? What about the sort of communication from company to company? Do you facilitate investee company? events because I can imagine there's a lot of synergy that can be extracted from all these companies within the group. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always skeptical of the word synergy. So synergy is one of those ones. I'm that sorry. Looks- I shouldn't have used <laughs> the word synergy. Maybe that's showing my age. No, but it, it's my PR the- roots probably. <laughs> it's one of those things that looks fantastic in textbooks, but very rarely works in, in real life. But yeah, you, you're right. There's a lot of opportunities. And I think it's more about best practice. Now, if you put a bunch of smart successful entrepreneurs in a room together there's you know just as we're sharing best practice here it's you learn stuff and you apply things so yeah we have we use a slack platform everyone's on that we do monthly uh, zoom calls that everyone jumps on when there was when covid hits hard in the uk last year we moved that to a weekly call because things were changing so rapidly and people were sharing and look for a lot of us uh, yourself included i'm sure that the global financial crisis didn't seem that long ago. So it's still, it's still quite fresh. There was a lot of sharing about what did I wish I'd done sooner in that. And yeah, this is what we've, how we've just communicated with our staff and this worked and this we completely screwed up. But don't do it like that. And so there's a lot of that, yeah, communication and sharing. And yeah, we've got companies seconding their staff to go and work in other companies now and learn, which is great because it's, it's very difficult to do career development in a small business for your employees. So it's nice to be able to. No, I, I absolutely hear you. And Callum, I, having run a small, or a number of businesses now in different countries over the last 25 years, I've always thought what you're offering is a fantastic opportunity for business owners. And if people want to find out more about you, how and where can they go and even do one of your five minute online jot form podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if you're an entrepreneur, business owner, I'd love to speak to you. And probably the easiest thing is just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty active there. I'm sure my email and stuff will be in the show notes, as they always say. But cl at callumlang.com usually gets to me. But yeah, LinkedIn's a good place to reach out. Mention Callum. Jim James and I'll send you a free copy of my book as well. Oh, you make that sound so special, but I have spied that there's a free copy download on Enterprise <laughs> Zone does. Busted. <laughs> but still say that you heard about on the unnoticed. I, I, that. That's the Progressive Partnerships book, which is all about scaling your business. But I will share with them the, the agglomerate book, which is all about small businesses joining together in PLCs. Callum, thanks for joining together with me. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to think of you in Singapore, my other home. Thank you so much for joining me in the UK, where I believe it's hotter today than it is in Singapore. That's uh, been, been great to catch up again. Yeah, lovely to chat. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Callum Lang, who's the founder and CEO of the MBH Corporation PLC. And I will, of course, include his details all in the show notes. And until we are together again, I wish you the very best of health, the best of business, and that you keep on communicating. My name's Jim James. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Unnoticed Show.